Uh, a lot of people around here call me Pastor Ben, uh, but I just kind of pretend to be a pastor here. I, I serve in a ministry that oversees a lot of churches, and our headquarters is nearby. And so I love the team here. Uh, we love the pastors that you guys have, that we have. My family worships here uh, regularly, has been for the last three years, and uh, we love this church. Uh, pastor Greg, Pastor Greg was the victim <laughs> of the board conspiring with Pastor Lisa. And they said, you know, this 60th birthday thing, we want to stretch it out a little bit. And uh, so his whole family, his, all of his kids have come together uh, with him this weekend. The board said, why don't you take a weekend off? Just enjoy your family. And so that's where he is. And uh, we're so thankful. Aren't you thankful for a, a church board that takes care of their pastor? And says, look, we want, we, want you to, we want you to last. And so take some time to rest and renew yourself. And Pastor Greg pours out a lot. All of our pastoral team here uh, is, is just so appreciated. And, uh, and I know that you guys love them. And so I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be looking at chapter 14 today. Luke 14, if you have a Bible, you can flip it open or you can open it on your phone and just search the name Luke and then the number 14. I'm sure you'll find Bible Gateway or the Bible.com app or some way that you can read along. God's Word is very accessible uh, to us. We can find it. So Luke chapter 14. Now, as you're turning there, I just want to say, uh, as way of set up an introduction to the Gospel of Luke, Luke was, was not, he was a Gospel writer who did not meet Jesus personally. Uh, he met Jesus like we did through the witness of someone else who told him about Jesus' life, but he had an advantage over us. There were still eyewitnesses alive at the time that he was writing this gospel, and so he was a physician by training, and so he went and set about to have an orderly account of Jesus' life. He wanted to make sure he heard from eyewitnesses, what did Jesus say? What did he really say? And what did he mean? And why did he say that? And, and, and Luke starts in the first section of his writing in the Gospel of Luke. He, he writes about Jesus coming. And how would he have come? He, Luke very well may have met Mary, the mother of Jesus. Or he would have known somebody who heard from her. What it was like when they, when they went, all the world was to be taxed, Luke chapter 2. And they, that's, taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And so uh, Joseph, her husband, they went up right to Bethlehem. And it's like Christmas in July right now, right? And uh, when they get to the Bethlehem, there's no room for them. And so they have the baby out in the, in the, the stable, and, and all of that's happening, right? Luke wanted to hear that story. He wanted to hear it from somebody, not just who heard about it, heard about it, but somebody who actually knew it. And he put together this, this collection of these stories so that everyone who would read this would know an orderly account, a true eyewitness account of Jesus. Now, he did that in, in a way that, that he laid out the first section about Jesus coming. Then he lays out a section of his, of his gospel where Jesus is proclaiming what his kingdom is about. And in that time, he is, uh, he's doing a lot of talking. He's doing a lot of healing, a lot of ministry among the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. He's, he's finding the people who are, who are on the outside, the outskirts of society, the marginalized, the people who get overlooked by the people who are, are the religious leaders and all of that. He's looking, he's looking around and he's saying, my kingdom is for all of these people and, and the people who should be responding, the, the people who should be listening to Jesus and coming close, they're rejecting him. They're, they're actually uh, going to, in just a, a couple chapters from what we're going to read today, they're actually the, the religious leaders. <laughs> Think of the irony of that. The religious leaders are going to put together a plan to kill him because they're, he's so disruptive and they're saying, no, no, we know better than, than God's own son. We, we know better how to get these people in line and straight with God, and Jesus is disrupting it all. We've got to get rid of him. And so Jesus is reaching out to these, these poor and sick and blind and lame. He, he's, he's, he's reaching out to the, the marginalized people, and he's saying, I'm being rejected by the people who should be accepting me, so I'm changing, I'm changing my tune here. Everybody's welcome. I'm here for everyone who will come. Everyone who will come be part of my kingdom is welcome. And, uh, and Jesus then here in this third section, he, uh, he ends up uh, kind of, Luke starts writing and, and showing us Jesus at the table. And we're going to see Jesus at the table today at a banquet. And uh, throughout the next couple chapters, there's dinners that Jesus is part of where he's the host and sometimes he's the guest. 
And, and Luke kind of writes for us to show us Jesus at the table. It's going to culminate, right, on the night he was betrayed by a friend and then ends up going to the cross and dying, right? And where does he go with his, with his disciples that night? He goes to a table. Remember that table where there's bread and there's, there's wine, and he says, this is my body that's broken for you, and this is my blood shed for you. And, and right, all of this is, is happening at the table, because at the table, more happens than just eating. Years ago, I was, uh, I was on an extended fast, and I had gone days without eating food. This is a, some of you know about fasting in like a medical way, right? Your doctor says, I want to do a blood test, so don't eat anything all the night before, and then come get your blood tested, all that kind of stuff, right? And so you know from a medical way, some of us know from a spiritual way. The, the scriptures teach about uh, fasting. Jesus himself fasted, and I, I am a follower of Jesus. I try to be like Jesus. I have a long way to go, quite honestly, but, but I'm trying to be like Jesus. This week, my son and I were out in Colorado, and we were hiking through the mountains. And, and as we were hiking, he, he mentioned something that he had learned somewhere along the line, that, that uh, in, in this Jewish culture, people studied from their rabbis. They studied from these teachers, and, and some of them wanted to become rabbis. And so to become a rabbi, they would follow the teacher, and they, they took it so seriously that they would try to lay their own footprints into the footprints of the teacher that they were following. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought, what a picture of what discipleship is like. When we become a disciple of Jesus, we are trying to make our feet land right in his footsteps, right? Right? We were trying to live our lives like him. I was fasting. I was taking time away from eating food. I was praying. And, and so uh, if you've ever fasted, you know, like sitting at the table where there's food, uh, a little challenging, right? Uh, and so, you know, what do we do? We go find a prayer closet. We go find a bedroom or somewhere else we can go to, to pray. So for these, these several days, I was not going to the dinner table with my family. I was just going into another room to pray. And uh, what I found after a couple of days is as, as much as I was trying to get closer to God, I was finding myself more isolated from my family because there's something more that happens at the table than just the food we eat. There's the, how was your day? Well, this is what my day was like. We talk about the good things that we experienced in our day. We talk about the bad things that we experienced in our day. We, we make jokes. We laugh with each other and and sometimes at each other, right? And, uh, and so, like, that's, there's just something that happens at the table. Jesus, because of the writings of Luke, we get to see Jesus at the table, and he shares some important things that help us to understand his kingdom. Jesus, uh, in verse 1 of Luke 14, is, is the guest of a prominent Pharisee. Let's read here together. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Now, now Pharisee is a a biblical term. You read this here. A Pharisee was a person, a religious leader, who interpreted the law. He was was the rule keeper for the, the people of God. The scribes were the people who made sure that all the rules were written down. The Pharisees made sure that the that the rules were followed. The Pharisees believed that if, if, if Israel, if all of the people of God could start obeying the law good enough, that God would stop being mad at them and would send a deliverer, a Messiah, to set them free because they were under the oppression of the Roman government. You don't know anybody like that, do you? You don't, you don't know anybody who's like, if I could just be good enough, then God won't be mad at me. Like, if I could just be good enough, God will, will maybe hear my prayer. Some, sometimes I talk to people, they're like, my prayers bounce off the ceiling because, like, God's not going to listen to things I say because I know what my life is like. That's like a Pharisee who says, if I can just get it right, God will love me. And Jesus is going to go to the Pharisee's house to say, God loves you not because of who you are or what you've done. He loves you because of who he is, and he created you. And that's the truth for you. God loves you so much, he is reaching out even today. As we read the scripture, the words that we hear at the table are Jesus' words that are echoing us today. They're saying to us, you are invited to my table. You're invited to my kingdom. And he's being carefully watched. Have you ever been carefully watched? My, my father-in-law, he has a big family, so they host a lot of picnics and stuff. And uh, I remember years ago when I first started going around there, very interested in his daughter, and uh, one of the things I learned was that sometime during the picnic, he would start yelling. And he'd be like, hey, any announcements? 
Any announcements? He'd say to the, the, the nieces and the nephews that brought their boyfriends and girlfriends, are you guys getting married? Any announcements? Are you getting married? Anybody pregnant? Everybody, you know, what, what's the announcements, right? And Yeah. And so, like, I learned real quick, like, you found your way, like, out of visual sight uh, before you got called on if there was any announcements. I also remember when I was really looking forward to the family picnic because we had an announcement to make, you know. And uh, we've had several announcements we've been able to make. He was being carefully watched. I know what that's like. After 20 years of marriage, I'm still being carefully watched. All right, verse 2. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. And Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Now Jesus asked this question to the Pharisees, right? They're the rule keepers. Is it lawful for me to heal this man? Or will it glorify God more if I just leave him sick? And they're silent. So he goes ahead and heals him. They weren't very happy about that. In fact, it's this habit that Jesus had of healing people on the Sabbath day that ultimately leads to them plotting to take his life. You see, you may not know all of the rules or all of the laws of the Old Testament. There's a lot of them there in the first five books of the Bible that are, that are kind of listed for us. And certainly by Jesus' day, the Pharisees had even added to a list of their own rules and laws just to help people not even get close to breaking God's law. And so uh, Jesus, is, you may not know all of those. You may know that there's like a top 10 list of the, of the laws of God. We call them the Ten Commandments, right? And so you got this top 10, like these are the most important 10. One of them says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Don't work on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus is challenging the rule keepers, like what, how close are we getting here to breaking the rules? Like, am I supposed to leave this guy sick or can I heal him? And they're silent because they don't know how to say, just leave him alone. Come into dinner. Like we, we invited you over to dinner. Jesus must have been in the same town because certainly he would not have been able to walk to a Pharisee's house because he would have been working. This is the way it worked. The rabbi in your town would tell you like how far you could go in the law. And so sometimes you'd say, Rabbi, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to dishonor the, the Sabbath day. So how far can I walk? And the rabbi would say, well, you can, you can walk to your mailbox and back. You're okay. But if you go past your mailbox, now you're working. But another town would have a rabbi. They didn't have the internet, right? Uh, and so the other, they would say, well, that rabbi learned from his rabbi, right? So rabbi, how far can we walk on a Sabbath before we're working? And he would say, well, you can walk to the end of your block and back to your house. You're not working. But if you go farther than to the end of your block, then you're working, right? And I know, listen, I know this is crazy. But people in the Bible would listen to their teacher and then they would talk to their relatives from other towns. And they would say, what, is, what does your rabbi say it is like too far to walk on a set? Well, our rabbi says to the mailbox. Well, oh, well, our rabbi says to the end of the block. Really? They would take that back to their town. They'd be like, well, some rabbis say that I can walk to the end of my... I mean, this is the difference between what my son was doing a year ago right now, right? Where we're flattening the curve. He's standing on his side of the street and his friend across the street, and they're talking to each other across the street, right? Because of social isolation, doing all of that, right? But there's a big difference if you can only go to your mailbox and if you could go to the end of the street. I mean, a big difference for you, right? Be able to play with your friends. Yeah, I know you don't know anybody like this who tunes in to watch online, on Facebook, their Sunday service here at the bridge, and just keep scrolling until they find another preacher, just to listen. Well, what does that preacher say? I know you don't know anybody like that. We've gotten way past that as people. This is ancient history that people were like that. And Jesus, this is why Jesus attracted all these crowds who came around, right? Because they wanted to hear, what does this rabbi say? And this rabbi, this teacher, is healing people. Like they are sick and broken, and he is touching them, and they are healed. By the way, God still heals. Jesus is still healing people's body. Perhaps even today, God can heal you if you've come in with a sickness or a disease or a, a brokenness in your body. God still heals. 
but they remained silent. Verse 5, then he asked them, if one, of, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. And now Jesus goes from being watched to doing the watching. Look at verse 7. When he noticed, somebody say noticed. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. I, I would guess probably Jesus actually found his seat at the foot of the table. He's probably sitting at the, the other end from the host. This is what he says. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you, somebody say both of you, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat, then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, uh, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Have you ever wondered about having Jesus over as a dinner guest? This Pharisee is about to learn a lesson. <laughs> Because Jesus starts by confronting them before he gets in the house as he heals the guy and they're all silent. And Jesus capitalizes on the silence to go ahead and just start insulting people. <laughs> he, he observes that all of these guests are, are coming in the room and they are finding the better seats, right? The higher profile seats, the priority seats. He notices nobody is finding the lower seats and so he confronts all of the dinner guests that are at the table and says, y'all are doing this wrong. You, you picked the wrong seats. I watched you. I watched both of you. I, that, that means husband and wife. I watched both of you come in here, check with each other and be like, we're going to the front. We're going to this places of honor. Now, this is an ancient world problem. We don't wrestle with this anymore today. We don't, we don't struggle with this people who want like their profile exalted like we don't do that anymore you know we've gotten way past that and when this week we were out in Colorado I took some some selfie I don't get this part we I took some selfies with my son and stuff when I take a selfie you get from like right here to right here right and I work really hard to try to get the mountain in the background like I don't know how all of that works but but here's the thing on my like Instagram account there's these girls. Their selfies are always like head to toe, like on balconies with like waves in the background and little bluebirds singing all around them. Like, I'm like, how do, how do you get all of that in your selfies? It's because of the selfie boyfriend. Now, some of you are selfie boyfriends. You, you know what I'm talking about. We're going to have an altar call for you later. <laughs> it's not for your repentance. It's just to pray pray for you. I, I, my heart goes out to you. Because she hands you the phone, and she's like, take my picture. And then, so you're like, okay. And she's like, no, you got to step farther back. Make sure you're getting my shoes in the picture, because shoes are, are important, apparently, I'm told. And so, you know, the, boy, the, the selfie boyfriend steps back, and, he, you know, he's, get, and he's taking a bunch. Just so you know, if you've never had this duty, you take a lot of pictures just to make sure you get the one. And then you've got to make sure you're doing the right angles and, and all of that, right? So that you can get the whole thing. Why? Because we want people to see our profile and we want them to say, wow, like that's an impressive profile. So God bless the selfie boyfriends who take care of the selfie husbands, perhaps. We'll pray for you as well. Now, look, Jesus demonstrates something right here. I think that we, we, we probably pass over a little quickly that Jesus says, I'm talking to both of you. In their culture, the, really, the teaching was only for males. It was only for young men. It, it was the young men that they, they trained up. There wasn't a lot of teaching that went into to the women. In fact, I see a little hypocrisy here at this dinner party, right? The Pharisee, the rule keeper, he has invited these people over for dinner so that they can rest, have you ever hosted a dinner 
right? It's like Thanksgiving when I'm sitting at the table. Uh, come on in, family. We're going to have a great time. Let's just all, re- like Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. Let's just all sit at the picnic table. Babe, can you bring me a sandwich? You know, like somebody's working. Do you see the hypocrisy there of, of the rule keeper who says, we got to keep, who's really mad right now that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, but he's got no problem that, that his wife or his servants are, are busy working in the kitchen to make sure that they can feed this group. Jesus says, listen, I'm talking to both of you, male and female. Think about taking the lower place so that you can be exalted rather than taking the higher place and being humbled. We have learned that coming to Jesus' kingdom means that we have to humble ourselves to come close to him. Some of us have found this word to be true because we have actually been humbled on our way to the kingdom of God. No matter how much we had our lives together, no matter how much success we were able to put together, still we needed to be humbled when we finally came to a place to say, I can't make life work on my own. I'm desperately in need of God to touch my life. And when we humble ourselves, God says, then you're welcome. These are the ones. I have better seats for you. Come closer. This is the promise of God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Well, that would be an awesome sermon, but I've got to keep going. Here we go, verse 12. Jesus has just insulted all the guests that they took the wrong seats. Verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite these losers. I mean, um, (laughs) do not invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. That's the problem. Your hospitality is shrouding your greed. You have have welcomed us to this table, but you have done so and you have filled this table with people who can bring you to their table. It's, it's It's like when you have kids who are graduating high school And so you have a party for them, and you invite all the people who, or or a wedding, where people are going to bring some gift in an envelope to pay, right, to to give this young bride and groom, and you put all the money into the food, but you're like, let me look at that list. Uh, No, don't bring them. Yeah, he'll pay me back. You know, the the gift he gives you will cover the meal that I'm paying. Some of you know what this is like. And what's the deal? The deal is when you invite me to your wedding or whatever, I bring you a gift, and then when I have one for my, you come, you give me. Like, we have this, uh, we never do that. Come on. We we never find ourselves surrounded by people that are like us, that that kind of do the same things we do, talk about the same things we do, and, and we're all pretty comfortable together. We don't find ways where we exclude people that, that we don't really want to be around. This, this is an issue that only happened in, in the Bible times. But Jesus keeps teaching. Verse 13, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, these people are struggling because they look, at, they look at this teaching that we're supposed to bring the poor and the lame and the blind. Like, those people don't have anything. And Jesus is saying, yes, this is what my ministry is about. They can't repay you, but these are people who are precious. The marginalized, the ones who are, who are left out, the ones who are never, you know, hashtag blessed, you know. They, they just didn't have enough stuff. This is another Bible time problem that people kind of equated if they had a lot of stuff that they were blessed and if they didn't have stuff, then they wish that God would bless them. That, that doesn't happen to us anymore, right? Nobody struggles with that kind of thing. And, and yet, these people are, are looking around saying, well, we are blessed. We, we're hosting you to our table. And Jesus is saying, yeah, what about the, what about the people that are really blessed, who, who will never make it to your table, but they can make it to God's table? Well, what if you made your table God's table? What if you said, you're welcome here, and I'll pay the bill? What if you said, I'm not worried about whether you can repay me. God will take care of that. I can trust him with that. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection 
of the righteous. Man, there's a lot there, and it'd be a great sermon, but I got to keep going. Verse 15. When one of those at the table heard him, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Don't you love this guy? Think about the table right now. Jesus started with healing. They're all quiet. He comes in and insults the guests that they took the wrong seats. Then he turns to the host and says, you did this all wrong. You got the wrong people at this table. Man, Jesus isn't holding back from anybody. And so I think probably the dinner got real quiet. You ever been in a quiet place? It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. We, we don't like quiet. We like to keep the conversation moving. And when it gets quiet, I found I've been in places that are quiet. It's not very quiet long, even when we're having like a moment of silence. There's always somebody that like clears their throat. <clears> throat> Especially in church, right? Because somebody does some spiritual be like, mmm. You ever sit next to the spiritual guy, like in the middle of service, pastor says something, pastor Greg's preaching, says something really profound, people are taking notes, and some dude goes, mmm, it's usually me, I'm sorry about that, I gotta, I gotta work on that, I gotta fix that, mmm, or, or maybe you start laughing a little bit, like we, we just heard, it. But here's what I learned, when I grew up in church, there was Sister Reva, and so no matter how quiet church was, Sister Reva had a big purse, and so she would reach in, you know, uh, Werther's Originals. Uh, our great snack at church. Some of you know about that. Before the Werther's Originals, though, there's the clear plastic ones, you know, that taste like menthol. And, uh, and so you, you would take the, the, the candy and you would unwrap it. And, and you guys know this sound? You, you know that sound? I mean, that'll disrupt an awkward, silent moment. There in the, the presence of God, man, you just start hearing Sister Reva's candy. Werther's original came along. Man, that changed Sundays for me. That was like revival happened. <laughs> I wasn't clever enough to bring a candy like this. The old lady in the service before, the first service this morning, she gave me this piece of candy on the way out. She said, here, I know you like these candies. And uh, so I'm so, so thankful. That old lady's still in the second service too, I think. I probably should not have called her old. But um, <laughs> this guy's at the table when Jesus is talking to all these people, and it is quiet, and he is trying to break the silence, probably a middle child. I'm a middle child. I'm a bridge builder. Like, let's, let's get this thing back on track. And so what does he do? He says, we're all religious people. Jesus is a religious guy. So let's all get back on. Uh, let's put our focus back on the kingdom of God. And he says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Am I right, Jesus, or am I right? You know? You got those people in your connection group, you know, they just always have the right answer. You know, he's just, I really think he's just trying, right? He's trying to get things, but he has made a mistake because he's not picking up what Jesus is laying down yet. And Jesus is, Jesus hears this guy who's talking about some feast in the kingdom of God and doesn't realize he is sitting across the table from the bread of life. Jesus calls himself the bread of life in the book of John. He says, look, if you come nourish yourself in a relationship with me, you will never hunger. And you're talking about some feast in the kingdom. We can all look forward to that. I'm telling you, I am the feast. God has heard your prayer. He is reaching out to you through me, and I am the feast. This poor guy, he turned to his neighbor and asked for a little piece of candy. Verse 16, this is Jesus' reply to that guy. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the same time, of the, or at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now 
ready. They, they didn't have phone calls or text messages. They've been cooking this big feast. It's time to let them know. And so this worker in the house, his job is to go out, knock on the doors, let the, let the invitees know it's time. You can come on over. The meal is ready for you. Verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. In verse 19, another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Verse 20, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Notice he doesn't even have like a please excuse me at the end of his. <laughs> this worker, this servant goes outdoors, knocks on the door. My, you know, just so you know, the, the owner of the house, he's ready for you. He has, uh, the, the banquet is prepared. You all got your invitations. I'm just here to let you know it's time. And he runs into excuse after excuse after excuse. The first guy, listen, this is his excuse. I bought a field and now I need to go see it. Have you ever heard of people buying property without looking at it? Some of you have. You're about to if you haven't. Um, because you may remember back in like 2006, in 2007, property, real estate property in America was just, just out of astronomically high prices. Remember that? And you, you couldn't buy a house fast enough. Like, you couldn't get a contract. It's, it's gotten a little bit that way recently uh, with the number of people who are moving and, and buying houses. And, and so everything was just up. And, and my, my father-in-law was a real estate investor, and, and he called us from Myrtle Beach. He called my wife. I was out visiting a, a man in the church. And uh, he said, hey, you and Ben should buy one of these condos. And uh, two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo is going to be built. And when it gets built, then you can put it up for sale and do what's called flipping. You can sell it for more than you bought it for under contract, never actually pay for it, just take the profit off of that transaction. And uh, by the time I got home, my, uh, my wife let me know uh, that we had, we had bought a piece of property. Uh, we had, had bought a two-bedroom, two-bathroom two house condo, condo building that, that was not even built yet. And, uh, and I said, okay, wow. All right. She, well, my dad said we should do it. Okay. And, um, hmm, all right. So we now have a verbal contract. We're then getting sent paperwork. We're signing, signing a contract. Before you do, you have to talk to a bank to make sure you're pre-qualified for your loan. And, uh, and they said, uh, okay, so do you want this condo? We're like, yeah. They're like, okay. Nobody ever asked to see a pay stub. Nobody asked me for a W-2. Nobody asked me for a tax return. It was what was called a no-doc loan. No documentation. Do you remember this colossal problem for America? Some of you are old enough to remember. And uh, I just remember thinking, like, this is crazy because, like, I don't have any money. Like, I'm, like, seriously, like, all of our money goes to pay my mortgage on the house we live in and, like, our groceries and stuff. I, I can't afford another payment. But it's okay. You're flipping. And in flipping, you don't have to pay anything. You just get the house built and then sell it to somebody before you make a payment. And I thought, well, that, that will be really cool, but it will be really bad. If I can't sell it. And I said to my father-in-law, like, wait a minute. If, if everybody's building these and, like, everybody's buying them at the same time and we're all flipping them, that means all of our for sale signs are up at the same time. Like, won't that make us compete against each other? It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I remember over that year and a half as it was being built, stories began to emerge of units that were finished and being sold. And, uh, and it really put us on track that when our unit was finished and sold, we were going to pay off our mortgage on our primary house because of the profit we were going to make on this two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo that I had never seen. And then right about the time it was completed, headlines began to come out in the news that began to say that banks were seeing an increase in the number of uh, defaults on loans. And suddenly, some people who had never shown any documentation and got loans didn't have the money, as it turned out, to be able to pay back those loans. Some of you still, when I talk about this, 2008, <laughs> some of you still remember, man, the pain that came because of how everything collapsed during the Great Recession. And thankfully for me, I know some of you are going to be envious right now, 
we actually sold our two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo to a woman who had to borrow cash from her family because banks would not lend her enough money to buy it. And they bought it, and we walked away with a couple thousand dollars, which was far from being able to pay off our mortgage, and I couldn't have been happier. I was just so thankful to be out of that. So I bought and sold a piece of property I never saw. I'm as dumb as the guy in this story (laughs) who has an invitation to the banquet, and his excuse is, I bought a piece of property. I haven't even seen it yet. I need to go. But here's what I'm wondering, Jeremy. I'm wondering, like, Was the land not going to be there tomorrow? Like, were they packing it up, taking the land away? Like, I don't know, where's the land going that I can't go have dinner tonight? Now, I got to go find this piece of land. I got to find it. I bought it. I heard about it. I got to go find it. Maybe there's a Brooklyn Bridge built. I don't know, but but I bought this field, and now I got to go and see it. Hmm. Verse 19, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. I call this the test drive excuse. I got to go try out my oxen, my five yoke. That's 10 oxen, o- oxes, o- o- oxes. In. Now, look, I've told you people before, I'm not a gardener, farmer. Agri- I tried last year. I grew a garden. I learned a lot, so I planted one again this year. It's terrible. Like, it's worse than last year, my first one. This year, I tore a lot of it out because it just didn't work. And so I got to get that going again. But... It's probably too late now, but I, so I don't know a lot about this. Just be quite honest with you. But I, in my imagination, I figure if I'm buying oxen, then I'm probably going to an auction, right? And they bring them out, like in you know, and here's your animals. Who wants to buy this animal? And I got to figure that the oxen that are like real skinny and like can't hardly walk are not the ones I'm going to buy. But the ones who are big. And strong and look like oxen probably are. You probably can hook them up and plow a lot of stuff with your five yoke of oxen. And they're still going to be there tomorrow. Why in the world would you pass up the banquet to go test drive your oxen? And this guy who says in verse 20, I just got married and I can't come. Now listen, he doesn't say excuse me because he's already excused. He's actually quoting from the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 5 says this. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Can I get an amen on that? Jesus came and fulfilled the law. There's a lot of stuff in the law. We don't really have to track all that anymore the same way because Jesus came. And a lot of us are thankful for that. But I got to be like, bring this one back. Could we just bring this part like forward with us into the Jesus era? Like give us a year off. And, And why does he need a year? To learn how to make his wife happy. Ladies, can I get an amen? Like, wouldn't you like to have had a year to get him trained, right? And this guy needs it. This guy needs it. He, he's, he's excused. Sorry, man, I just got married. I can't come to your free dinner. Instead, I'm dedicating myself to learning how to make my wife happy, and she's cooking dinner tonight. Like, wouldn't it have made more sense to be like, babe, to make you happy tonight, I actually found dinner plans for us. Like, we can go eat over there. She probably would have liked that. (laughs) Jesus uses, I think Jesus uses this excuse on purpose. He's saying to them, people got important things about what they buy and what they do. And here's a guy who's actually quoting the law. And what I'm telling you is, if you want to miss the banquet, if you want to miss the feast in my kingdom because of excuses like this, even if you're building it on the law, you're missing out on a banquet that was prepared for you. Verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to the master, all these excuses. Then the owner of the house became angry 
and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Anybody picking up on a theme of who Jesus is reaching out to? The people who didn't feel like they were ever invited to begin with. The people who never thought they could get a seat at the table. Go and find them. Bring them in. Verse 22, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. Somebody help me. But there is still room. I've done what you said. I went out into the streets and the alleys. I gathered up everybody I could and I brought them in. But I'm looking around the room and I'm realizing there, there's still room. And I'm not, I'm not the kind of servant who just sits back and, well, I did what he said. I went and knocked on the doors. I reported the excuses. And then he told me to go get other people, so I went and got them. I guess we're done, and the servants are going to get a lot of leftovers. Like, this is going to be great. No. The servant is interested in the party. And so he goes to the master. He says, listen, owner of the house, listen, there's still room. There's still room. What do we do? There's still room. Verse 23, the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. No leftovers. I added that last part. Go find them. Get out of the town, go to the country lanes, go to the byways, find people, get them here. And the servant is like, yes, I'm into that. I want the master's house to be full. The master wants the house to be full, but there's still room. I love this servant who says, I got a job to do to make sure that the table is full. I got a job to make sure that the banquet is eaten. And I'm going to take the invitation to anybody the master says can come. And now who is the master inviting? Everyone. See, the Gospel of John says that Jesus came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But to everyone who receives him, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. Jesus came to the ones who should have. He's sitting at the table that night, right? He's sitting at that on that Sabbath day with the Pharisee and all the all the rich friends, and he's saying, "You people had an invitation, but you're rejecting it. You're pushing it away." And so now the invitation has expanded. To anyone that will come. And so as I wrap up this message, I want to touch base on just a couple things that stand out to me from this passage. If you've taken notes, you might want to write this down. Number one, there are excuses for many guests. There are excuses for many guests. They, they bought a piece of property they never saw. That was dumb. Don't do that. If I didn't make that clear enough, don't do that. That was dumb. They, they just, they, they bought five yoke of oxen, and they got a good test drive. They got married. They got, man, they got excuses. They, they just don't have anything ready yet. They don't have the right thing to wear to come close to, to the banquet. They, uh, they're too busy as they're working so hard to make their life successful. They don't have time to come to the banquet. And they knew people they knew people who were invited and kind of went to, the, went to the table. And honestly, they turned out to be jerks. And so they're like, I, you know, I heard about what happens at the, at the banquet. I, I heard about those kind of people. I, I'm going to let the people that I know keep me from coming to the banquet that's been prepared. I, I, I got excuses. I, I, I'll do it later. I, I can come later. I just can't come right now. And Jesus is saying, man, the invitation is here and now. I'm telling you, the dinner is ready and it's getting cold. And if if you're going to reject my invitation, then we're just going to keep asking. We're going to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking because we want the house full. And honestly, you're sitting around some folks today. They're uh, They're like the second point. There is work for the servants. 
There's work for the servants. Because so you're sitting around some fo- folks today who got brought into the house, man. They've been invited to the banquet. We, we love it so much, we start working around the house. You ever been there? Like sometimes you're the guest, and when you first go in the house, the table's all set for you. And the second time you go to the house, they hand you a stack of plates, right? And they're like, can you help? You know? And uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's what our life is like. Those of us who have heard the invitation of, of God who says, come close to me. I've prepared something special for you. And we come into the house and we're like, sign me up. How can I help? And no wonder, it's no wonder that God describes his people in Isaiah 58 verses 11 and 12 this way. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. What do the people of God look like? They look like workers. What's their reputation? They're rebuilding. We're putting our hands in it. We're working. We got work to do because we are, we're making a difference. God has made a difference from us, for us. He has brought us to the table. And now we, we begin to learn from our heavenly father. We start saying, well, I got some work to do. And we start looking around the table and we say, there, there's a problem. There's still room. There's still room. I I can't be okay with the fact that there's still room. I can't be okay with the fact that people who should have come didn't, and now we've opened the door. Anybody can come, and there's still empty seats at the table. I, I can't be okay with that. So I'm going out to the alleys and the streets. I'm going outside of town to the, to the byways. I'm finding people. The master has said it's, it's free. It's open. Go get somebody and bring them to the table. Who are you bringing? to the table. Servants of God, who are you bringing to the table today? I believe right now, even as I preach, God will begin to put the names of people in our hearts, maybe someone we've been praying for a long time. We know that the invitation to God's table is for them and for their life, and they have been making excuses or they don't yet know the invitation is available. And right now, I believe the Spirit of God can be putting somebody on your heart that you're supposed to be praying for and say, God, there's still room. God, there's still room. There are excuses for many guests. There's work for the servants. And finally, there's room for more at the feast. You see, maybe you're a person who was making excuses for a long time. But today, today can be a day where you say, no more excuses. I'm not waiting any longer to respond to his invitation. God, here is my life with all of its faults, with all of its needs, I give my life to you. There's room for you at the feast. Some of you maybe have felt like, man, I've been working hard, I've been trying to get things straight, I've been trying to get things right enough. And I just want you to know, that's not on the invitation. Please respond when you're right enough. The invitation is just come as you are. And today, maybe you've been making excuses, but the excuses are over today. And you say, my life, my life needs to be surrendered to God. I need his forgiveness. I need to, he's given me an invitation to come close. How could I pass it up? But to come close to the creator of the earth that loves me. There's room for you at the feast. Years ago, Years ago, I lived up in Maryland, and my my wife taught at a school that my children were enrolled in. It was about 25 minutes away from our house. And the the weird thing was that most of the student body that went to that school lived 25 minutes on the other side. And and so we would have birthday parties for our kids, but all of their school friends lived almost an hour away. And um, I I had this experience more than once. Now, look, we we got pretty cool kids, pretty decent kids. I mean, we didn't have to tie pork chops around their necks to get the dogs to play with them. They're, they're cool. Like, people people like my kids most of the time. I, I like my kids most of the time. I'll tell you what, man. You have got the cake and the food, the pizza or whatever, and the, the sodas, and you've got the goodie bags, and you've got the games. But if nobody shows up, you got a heartbroken kid. And you send out the invitations, RSVP, call this number, please let us know, text us if you want, whatever. 
and like days are going by and you're not hearing from anybody and I've had more than one conversation with my wife where we said did we pick the wrong day did like how should we have done this different I've been there in the house when the, the appointed hour the clock is ticking and you know the party is supposed to start in two minutes and like no one has come to the door yet I know what that feels like as a father Maybe some of you know, but, but even if you've never had that experience, can you see how like that would be a problem for your kid? And because you love your kids so much, all you want is for people to come and celebrate them, right? All you want is like, let's fill the house, let's have a celebration and have some fun. We, we, actually, we actually started holding birthday parties 30, 40 minutes away from our house to try to get them in a place that people would actually come. Because it's terrible to have a party and have people not show up. And then we moved to Warrington. I love this place. It's like a real small town. Like everybody's like around. And so now we have birthday parties and like kids are like hanging out my back porch. They're like breaking my, my stuff. And it's awesome. It's awesome when, when you put the cake down and we're singing and then you're fanning the, because we don't blow on the cakes anymore because of COVID, right? You fan off the, the flames. You have your special cupcake that your, your son gets to blow out his. You know, and every... What a difference, man. When the house is full. Celebrating my son. See, Jesus is talking to this group and he's trying to get through to them to let them know that the table has been prepared and the bill has been paid for the whole meal through the sacrifice of Jesus himself as he went to the cross to die for you and me because of our sin that separates us from God. God's law said something has to die. Blood has to be shed in order to make atonement for lives that have been robbed from me. And Jesus, the perfect son of God, said, I'll go. I'll lay my life down. Jesus is talking to the very people who are going to plot his death so that his purpose can be fulfilled. And he's telling them, all of this is happening so that I can invite all people to the table. You have an invitation to his table. And I got to think that the Father, the Father in heaven is watching over. And he's saying, I've got a banquet prepared. Man, I've got the things cooking. We got them ready. We're bringing people to the table, and I want people to come here and celebrate my son. I know the feeling of a heavenly father who's looking at time ticking and wondering, will people surrender their lives to me while they have a chance? Will they turn themselves to follow me? I want my house to be full. And servants who are saying, Master, there's still room. There's still room. I'm just a servant today telling you there's still room. There's, there's still room for you. And I want to pray for you because today I believe that there's somebody in the house. I believe right now there's somebody who's hearing this invitation who's saying, I'm not walking out of here the way I came in. I'm making things right with God. He is offering me an invitation to come close. I may not be right enough. I may not have it all together. But God, here I am. All of my deeds, all of my faults, I'm here and I want to follow you. And I want to pray for you that way. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I pray for this, this church, Lord, these, this congregation, Lord, that has come together to hear your word. And those that maybe have come in today and they're hearing your invitation more than my sermon, they're hearing your invitation to come and follow you. So, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts right now in a way that only you can. That here in this group, there's somebody who's saying, I want to respond to the invitation of God to make my life right with him because of the work of Jesus Christ. I don't want to reject the invitation. I want to come close. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand up? Look at me. I'm not going to call you out or anything. I just want to make sure that I, I see you, that God sees you respond and, and hear you. Anyone today, lift your hand up. I had somebody lift up a hand in the first service last night, but it didn't go up very high. I, I didn't get to see it. Anyone today, you raise up your hand, look up at me, and then you can put it back down. Anyone today responding and saying, I'm responding to the invitation of God to come to his table. I want to talk to those who are viewing online right now for a few moments. I want to say that right there in your living room or wherever you're watching this service, perhaps you've heard this word and you realize there's room for you in God's kingdom. 
I, I want to invite you right there to, to begin to pray and talk to God. You know, the table is about conversation. And right now, as you're invited to the table, you can begin to talk with God through prayer. And I want to pray for those who may be responding. And there, there's a way there online that you can connect with people in this church that care about you and want you to know the truth of Jesus Christ and how to walk with Him. Today, those who make decisions to follow Jesus can find outside in the lobby here a, a bag that just says, follow Jesus, and there in the bag are, are resources to help you in a walk with God. I want to pray for those who are making this decision. Jesus, I pray, Lord, over those who are opening their hearts to you, hearing your invitation and desire to respond to it. Lord, would you begin to, to touch their life in a way, Lord, that they are able to confess their needs, they're able to confess their sin, their faults, take responsibility for that, but submit it to you in order to come close. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Just before we dismiss, I want to say this. I want to say that in this room, there are many servants of God, and our job is to fill the house. Our job is to take the word that there is still room. There is still room. There is still room. There is still room to bring people to the banquet of God. Lord, I pray that each of us would carry in our hearts, in our minds, and in our words the message that there is still room and that we would see others find the truth that we have found as we celebrate you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? Let's worship the Lord here for a moment. Our church leaders, connection group leaders, are going to find their way here at the, the front. If you have a, a need that you would like someone to pray with you, you can come and find one of them as we close our service to receive prayer. We're going to sing together here for a few moments. I'm going to come back and pray a blessing over you as we dismiss the service. Let's worship him. He is worthy of it all. his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. God bless you this week as you continue to walk as a servants of God. Amen.